that I would have to drive it. So. Let's go ahead and get back into law. Um, any final thoughts on, on at least, is, I just want to make sure we're clear on what Locke is up to here. Um, distinguishing willing from liberty, and that this is supposed to help us conceptually figure out the problem of free will. Hmm. What about our food example, boys? <laughs> what did you come up with? I, I still can't I still can't come up with anything for that. The act is not voluntary under liberty. Yeah. I feel hey. like if it has liberty then you were voluntarily choosing it. So what do you think of the case I was saying where you think you're in a locked room, but it's not actually locked. So you sort of stay there and you're grumpy, but you just never go and like check to see if it's unlocked. But you have the liberty to see if it's unlocked, right? Yeah, you do, but But you just you just never you you never the issue is whether you want to stay in the room or leave. You want to leave. You just never went up and like checked to see if it was locked. You assumed it was locked when it wasn't. I hate to make this so complicated, <laughs> but like, don't you voluntarily choose not to get up and check that it's not locked? Yes. <laughs> oh man, this is killing me. Probably a lame example because there's not two people. But um, I'm thinking about like, because like, like a like a video game program I made, like the the, the program has multiple options to do something, but so it has the liberty to choose all those options, but whatever option it actually has, that's not a voluntary choice because it's all determined by the program. So that would be, that seems to me like it would fall on this right hand side, right? But it has the liberty to do the, all those stuff. Why did it ha so how do you have the liberty to do the other? Depending on what the situation is, it could do any of those. But the program decides which one it is, yeah. not you. So this would then get into the same kind of issue that I, that I think you were raising with the quantum example that I was bringing up, which is, well, but it's still not up to your decision. Anyway, if you're really interested in this, <laughs> write a paper on it. <laughs> the next topic is a very different one. And this was, this is probably, maybe you think this about everything you read in this class, but this is one of the more abstract parts of what Locke is up to. Oh boy. And it has to do with how do we get the idea of substance? Did we do substance in intro? Oh, in bit. your section we talked some about substances, yes. Okay. With regards to that brain article about splitting your brain in half. Yeah, okay. And a few uh, of you who may have been in philosophy of religion also got exposed to this idea of what happens when you split your brain. Um, don't worry about that right now. Um, this whole issue is really important for Locke, for one, because he believes there are substances. Think back to Descartes. We talked about substance with Descartes with the wax argument, and as well, we talked about substance as well in, in our discussion of Meditation 6. Um, the other thing is, why is this hard for Locke? Is because he's an empiricist. And as an empiricist, he thinks all of our ideas come from experience. But you don't, as we're going to get into a little bit later tonight, you don't experience what a substance is. You, at best, experience the qualities of a substance, but you don't experience the substance itself. Before we get, don't worry if that's over your head for the moment. Let's turn to page 359, and let's just get started on this, and we'll see how this Hopefully, all comes together. Um, I'm going to read section one from book two, chapter 23. Um, and what I want us to think about as we read through this section is what reasons do, does Locke give for us to believe that substance or substratum exists? He says, The mind being, as I have declared, furnished with a great number of the simple ideas conveyed in by the senses as they are found in exterior things or by reflection on its own operations, takes notice also that a certain number of these simple ideas go con constantly together, which, being presumed to belong to one thing, and words being suited to common apprehensions, and made use of for quick dispatch, are called so united in one subject by one name. This inadvertence 
we are apt afterwards to talk of and consider as one simple idea, which indeed is a complication of many ideas together. Because, as I have said, not imagining how these simple ideas can subsist by themselves, we accustom ourselves to suppose some substratum to which they do subsist and from which they do result, which therefore we call substance. So why do we believe in substance? What are some of the... There's at least kind of two trains of thought I see in here. Um, they might actually ultimately maybe be one and the same thing, but what are some of the considerations that he gives for why we should believe that there are substances or substrata? Yeah, well, Is it because we believe and perceive all of these simple ideas and how they work together, mm -hmm. um, which would create substance, and then that forms our belief in substance? Yeah, I, I think this is like the real key thing is that think of all the ideas you have when we think of something like this water bottle. This water bottle is accompanied by, is just the way you think about it is a number of ideas. It's shape, it's kind of color, um, the way it, t you know, if you can't even taste it, the way it tastes, the way it smells. Those are all ideas that are united together in this one object. Well, Locke says, what, what holds all of these ideas together in one thing? Where do you get all those qualities? How come they all seem to hang out in this thing? And I can throw it around, and the ideas stay united together. Well, there's got to be something that holds all those ideas, that possesses the ideas. So if it weren't for substances, how would you explain how all these different qualities that we think things have stay together? So we need to suppose, you'll notice he says we don't see or we don't experience, but we have to infer, or we have to put forward that there is some kind of thing that holds all these different ideas together, that unites the ideas into one object. So that this, all the ideas that we, or, or the qualities that we associate with this bottle stay kind of tied together by one thing that has them. And Locke is saying here it seems to be the only way that we can unite all of these simple ideas together into one thing in one particular place and time. So substance is not something you experience or perceive, but it's something you have to postulate or infer in order to make sense of all, all those simple ideas that we think are united into one subject. Now, so this then raises the question, what is this idea of substance? Um, and we're going to see, he's going to tell us that we don't really have a particular, specific idea of substance. There is, when it comes to thinking about substance, it's a very vague and unspecified idea. A general notion of this kind of postulated entity. Once again, I'm going to read part of section two here, starting at the beginning and then I'm going to skip down. Um, so this is section two on 359. He says, Thus, if anyone will examine himself concerning his notion of pure substance in general, he will find he has no other idea of it at all, but only a supposition of he knows not what support of such qualities, which are capable of producing simple ideas in us. Skip down the bottom, like, five lines of that on that page. He says, and thus, here, as in all other cases where we use words without having clear and distinct ideas, we talk like children who being questioned what such a thing is, which they do not know, readily give this satisfactory answer, that it is something. In truth, this signifies no more when so used either by children or men but that they know not what, and that the thing they pretend to know and talk of is what they have no distinct idea of at all, and so are perfectly ignorant of it and in the dark. The idea, then, we have, to which we give the general name substance, 
being nothing but the supposed but unknown support of those qualities we find existing, which we imagine cannot subsist, sine re substante, without a substance, without something to support them, we call that support substantia, which according to the true import of the word is in plain English, standing under or upholding. So, Locke is saying we need to come up with something that has, that holds, that stands under those qualities that, that are in objects. Once again, otherwise, what would, how do you get all these qualities united into one thing? How come they don't fly apart? How come they stay together when, you know, over time? There needs to be some substance that holds qualities. Now, you need to also remember that substance itself cannot be another quality. If substance were another quality, like if substance itself was just extension or solidity or something like that, this would lead to an infinite regress. Because then you'd have to say, what holds the extension or the solidity? Another substance. And if that is just another extension, you say, well, then what holds that? and so on. You need to have something that's not a quality to end the regress. Because oh, if you say all qualities require a substance, then, whatever, uh, then you can't define substance as being another quality. So ultimately, what is a substance? He says it's something we're not sure of. It's th that part I, the second part I read, where he's saying, you know, it's like when kids don't know what they've just experienced. You say, hey, what you know, what caused that? And they say, a something. Well, that's not really informative. Well, in a way, <laughs> that's all Locke can say what a substance is. You ask Locke, what is a substance? He's going to say it's a thing. Well, tell me more about it. I, I can't. I don't know any more about it. All I know is there's got to be some substance, some thing that has qualities, because if there weren't a thing that had qualities, then you wouldn't be able to explain how ideas and, and qualities stay united together in one thing. Yeah? On the third bullet, why exactly is having an infinite regress a bad thing? Well, because in this case, there's a dependence relation. We think the qualities depend on the substance to continue to exist, to, to sort of have their being. So if you say that, well, if it just goes on infinitely, you never get to the bottom of of this chain of dependence. Sort of be like if I had a paper clip that was suspended by another paper clip. It's one thing if I can say there's something that's not a paper clip, like my hand holding it up, but if I just say it just is paper clips infinitely, that doesn't explain how this thing is hanging here. So if substance is supposed to be the reason that explains why the qualities exist, it can't just be qualities all the way down. Um, I want to come back to this issue, which is that this is a problem for empiricists like Locke. And when we get to the reading by Berkeley in a couple of weeks, um, which um, group number four should be preparing for, that um, this idea is hard for empiricists to accommodate because you don't experience substances. On Locke's view, what you experience are qualities. Like you experience the color, the shape, the, you know, the solidity, the sound, the taste. The, but you don't experience the substance as it is in itself. This is, once again, kind of like Descartes' point with the wax. With the wax, do you perceive wax <laughs> itself? Remember all the way back to that, Descartes says no you perceive those surface features or qualities of the wax. And that's why when the wax goes from being on the cold side of the room to the hot side, when you take it near the fire, all those qualities change. It's still the same substance or thing. But whatever that substance or thing is better not be what you are perceiving because everything you've perceived is different, but the substance is the same. So what Locke is trying to do is tell us that a substance is a special kind of idea we have. It's a complex idea. Um, <clears throat> so, but it's an idea we don't experience directly. 
what experience provides us with are these ideas ab about objects, about their qualities, not about the things themselves. But we can't experience what that object is in itself according to law. So we're looking at the apple here. You can see the redness of the apple, but the apple itself is not the redness. The redness is just a quality or a feature of the apple. You can see the roundness of the apple. But the roundness is not the substance of the apple. The roundness is once again just a quality or a feature that is that the apple possesses. The apple itself as a substance is something besides its redness, sweetness, roundness, firmness. Um, it's something that once again you can't perceive. But you have to believe there is a substance, Locke says, that has those qualities. Otherwise, what would explain how the roundness, the sweetness, the redness, and the firmness all remain united in that one thing? There needs to be some thing that has the qualities. It doesn't make sense to just say the apple is just a bunch of qualities tied together with, to nothing. Um, so, for Locke, an, a substance is something that we really don't have a clear idea about what it is. It's something you have to infer exists, because that's the only way to make sense of our experience of the world. But positively, what idea do we have of substance? It's just whatever it is, this I know not what, that holds the qualities together. Locke wants us to, since we don't have a direct experience of substance, substance is a complex idea. If you remember, simple ideas are those ideas that you get through experience, like just a basic color concept, like the concept of red. Red is a simple idea. Substance is not a simple idea. It's, the way I put it with the apple, is the apple is that thing, whatever it is, that is the cause of my ideas of sweetness, roundness, firmness, redness. The way that this is a complex idea, it's, just, it's this combination of ideas, of the cause of the holding of, of these qualities. <laughs> we don't, as, I was, as I've said a few times, we do not have a simple idea of substance because we have no direct experience of substances. What do you have direct experience of? The qualities. But the qualities are di distinct from the substance itself. Um, in the passage we read, and in other places, he emphasized that substance is what stands under the qualities. It's the thing that holds the qualities. It's the thing that gives the quality, that the, those qualities, their reality. And the relationship between qualities and substance is a dependent one. That the qualities, ex the, the existence of those qualities is dependent upon the existence of their substances. So the qualities exist because the substances exist, but not vice versa. Questions about substance so far? And um, this might, and I could even say, any questions about anything up to section about 14 here? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know if we went over this or not, at, um, if we touched on it, but did he, did Locke believe that these substances had extension or... Mater Good. This is the next point, then, is talking about material and immaterial substances. So, there are different kinds of substances. There are bodily substances, which are things that are extended, figure, and figured, and capable of motion. So, in Descartes' metaphysics, material substances. And then there are spiritual or mental substances. And these are things that are capable of thinking. He has a lot to say about this in sections 18 to 20 of the reading. Now here's the kicker for Locke. We, we have a very unclear idea of spiritual substance, whatever that might be, the substance that thinks. But Locke says 
our idea of what bodily substance is just as unclear. Because we, when we're trying to even understand what is the, the, the apple, what is the substance of the apple, even that we have to just say it's this I know not what that holds all these qualities. And if you, some people have argued against the existence of a soul on the basis of it, it's hard to imagine what an immaterial substance is. And Locke's response that he gives to this several times in our reading is that, well, if you think that's an argument against the soul, that's an argument against material things, too, because we have a very hard time even understanding what a material substance is. Now, Locke was the one that said, uh, is, it, is the reason that he's leaving this so vague, I guess, like that there's not a clear explanation, is because wasn't he the one that said, we have like limits to our knowledge and some things we just don't need to, or we'll, we'll never be able to answer, so we should just leave them for what they are? That's right. So he's got, in some ways, a kind of humble view of the limits of human reason. So he's going to say, we just may not be able, I mean, in principle, it's just beyond human capacities to know what substance is. And as a result of being kind of admitting, there's this lack of clarity and distinctness about our understanding of spiritual and bodily substances. He's agnostic about the mind-body relation. So... <coughs> If you were to ask Locke, are mind and body two separate substances, he would say, I don't know. They might be, they might not be. But he's quite open to the possibility that matter could think. Whereas Descartes did not think that was even possible. And I, I would say Leibniz as well. That they would both say that, the, that matter doesn't have the capacity to think. Like that's just incoherent to think matter is a thinking thing. But for Descartes, or for Locke, he says, I can imagine matter having thought in it. Um, this kind of goes back to that part from last week where Locke was saying, I, I don't think the mind always thinks. I think it's possible to go in for when you sleep, for instance, to have no thoughts at all. If Descartes thinks that the essence of the mind is to think, then in order for the mind to exist, it has to always be thinking. If it stops thinking, it stops existing. Locke is going to say, whatever the mind is, it could be a separate substance, like an immaterial soul, or it could just be a part of the body. It could be part of your brain. That that's just one power that the, the spirit has. That it's just one power and that the mind may be, have other powers with it as well. Did Locke ever touch on this, the uh, Leibniz subject of the monad? Like, did he, what did he think about that? I don't know offhand. Um, I know, so I do know Leibniz had a lot to say about Locke. I don't know if Locke had a lot to say about Leibniz. Okay. Um... In this section is where he does bring up how we come to know what kind of thing God is. Why? It kind of feels weird, like, right? where did this come from? We're talking about substances, and all of a sudden, God. That's partly because God is a certain kind of spiritual substance. Um, that on the traditional view, um, traditional Western monotheistic view, God is um, an immaterial substance. So let's take a look at how he does this on section, in section 33 um, and see how does he come up with the idea of God. And once again, think of his empiricism. Given his empiricism, that you only have ideas about things you experience, and he does believe in God. He wrote a book called The Reasonableness of Christianity. How can you as an empiricist explain how we get the idea of God? Uh, let's take a look at this. It says, for if we examine the idea we have of the incomprehensible supreme being, we shall find that we come by it the same way, and that the complex ideas we have both of God and separate spirits are made of the simple ideas we receive from reflection. Having from what we experience in ourselves gotten the ideas of existence and duration, of knowledge and power, of pleasure and happiness, and of several other qualities and powers, which it is better to have than to be without. When we would frame an idea of the most 
suitable we can to the supreme being, we enlarge every one of these with our idea of infinity, and so putting them together make our complex idea of God. For that the mind has such a power of enlarging some of its ideas received from sensation and reflection has already been shown. So, as an empiricist, how do we come up with the uh, idea of God? Yeah, Zach and Will's on deck. Um, is it taking all of the experiences of happiness, pleasure, and uh, all the kind of the simple experiences that we take and kind of combine that into a complex idea of what we think God would be like? I think that's, that's pretty good. Well exactly where I was going with it. We created through experience. We've experienced all these great powers that we would attribute to a, a you know, the perfect being, like the, the perfect person or something like that would be the best way to do it. Um, and through that we have derived the idea of a all powerful being because of all the similar things we combine into the complex. Good. So we have the idea of like what it is to be better than and then we have the ideas of like power, knowledge, pleasure, happiness. And we just say whatever is better to have, God has those qualities than not. So whatever is better to have than not to have, God would possess. And then of those qualities that we think that they have, we just say, and then God has them to the highest limits we can imagine, to infinity. To infinity and beyond. Quote, plus light here. So, um... It's interesting, so you can imagine <coughs> Locke is saying that this is consistent with believing in God, um, but you can imagine somebody who doesn't believe in God saying, yeah, that's how we invented the idea of God. And in fact, a lot of people in Locke's time thought that this was a threat to believing in God. Um, one, of the, one of his opponents, a bishop Stillingfleet, actually argued that because of that Locke's rejection of innate ideas and that Locke's um, explanation, especially of how we get the idea of God, is one main reason for people that people are atheists. Um, so he thinks that Locke's whole project runs contrary to um, what devout, good Christians should believe. Obviously, Locke disagreed. One of the readings you're going to do for next week is responding, not to stilling fleet, who I just mentioned, is responding to some other critics who think that Locke's views run contrary to um, run contrary to um, Christian views about eternal life. Any questions about what Locke is doing in this section on substance? Yeah. What would uh, be other examples of the immaterial substances? Maybe would be an angel. So, if it, like angels exist, they're not material beings, but they're still, you know, immaterial substances. All right. So, if there are other immaterial substances, they're going to be things like angels, God. So divine. Spiritual things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you have a soul, soul. Yeah. So, like, I know it's completely not related, but like, what about like Platonic objects? Are they <laughs> immaterial substances? Those generally are not thought to be substances at all. all right. So substances refer to particulars. All right. And in fact, we call we, it sounds strange to talk about immaterial things this way, but they would be concrete particulars. Whereas a Platonic object would be what we call an abstract. Um, universal. All right. In metaphysics, we talk also about ab the possibility of abstract particulars. Um, and Brianna would be glad to talk to anybody about tropes, I'm sure, if they're interested. She has perfect recall of that. <laughs> Any other questions about the notion of substance? So you see, why does Locke believe in substances? How do we get that idea? Um, what, and really, what is a substance? How is a substance different from a quality? These are all general things that you should have in your mind.
So this is what I want us to do in the last part of class here. Um, why don't we get together in, in groups, and I'll tell you what, just do them with people at your table, at your kind of nearby tables. Get into groups of two or three people, um, and answer these four questions that take us into that, the next part of the reading. So, uh, I believe that this starts us off on page 370, is, um, where you'll see section 9 begin here. And have somebody in your group take down your answers, and as we have time, we'll see if we can start answering them all together. Okay. 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 Okay.